Hello everyone, happy November. I'm so excited for this month. I'm excited for the books. I'm excited for the autumnal season. I'm excited you're here. I'm excited to get reading. For this vlog, I wanted to start uh, by telling you a couple of the books. Well, what I'm currently reading, um, the book I'm planning to start today, and a couple of books that are on my November TBR. I've been psyched about my November TBR for a little while now. Uh, putting books away on it for like a solid month now, which I try not to do because TBRs can really like trip me up. Um, but I, I am really, I'm really feeling good about this one. So I guess we'll see how it goes. But what I'm currently reading, I mentioned this in the last vlog, my October vlog, In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, and I'm really loving it. It is a memoir. It is, uh, it's sort of written in little snippet vignettes, like five pages max, typically. Um, it is overarchingly chronological, but each of the vignettes also is sort of topical and maybe dives into um, like a bit of a flashback or gives a very specific lens on a chronological event. Um, sometimes it dips into some history, sometimes it dips, it dips into some philosophy. Central to the theme and like topic of this memoir is a relationship that the author has with her girlfriend. Um, so it's definitely trying to and is successfully being part of the conversation of like heterosexual abusive relationships and why that is a really difficult conversation to have and why um, it, there are sort of friction and tension like entry points into that conversation both internally for like the queer community and also like the broader social conventions that inhibit that conversation from happening in like a heterosexual centric world um, and a heteronormative world so I think it's really really compelling um, I love the experimental format. He's writing in these like small vignettes. It is so lyrical. And I think that what is most important is that it definitely feels like it comes from the heart. But I love the intelligence of this book. Um, the author is just like clearly really, really sharp. Um, not just in sort of a traditional writer way of having these sharp observations, but she also like does her research digging into the history of like philosophy and literature and like presentation of abusive same-sex relationships and has like from a philosophical perspective has really complex contributions to the conversation um i think it's doing something really really smart and i'm really really liking it to be honest i feel like i've probably gotten the gist of the book by now so i might not have much to add to this later because i only have like like another 40 pages left of it but I'm I'm really really liking it memoir is probably my favorite genre I'm sort of realizing and when the author approaches memoir with experimental form and with some sort of level of like intellectualism that is my jam I love that anyway as for right now, the other thing I have to update is that this is the main book I have on my TBR for now. This book has been on my TBR for a really, really long time, and not just like over there, sitting in a stack virtually on my Goodreads TBR kind of TBR. It's been like moved to my currently reading. I have picked it up. I've put it on my bedside table. I've started listening to the audiobook. So anyway, the point is, is that I am making this my number one priority for the month and I am making myself sit down and read it because I am truly confident that I will love it. Um, I think I'm just really, really intimidated by it. Other than that, I have like a whole bunch of other things that are in my, in my radius that I'm thinking about. One is The Promise by Damon Gaugut. Um, this was a Booker Prize winner, which is a prize that I tend to get along with really well. Um, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin has really been catching my eye, and I have that out from the library right now, too. Um, Something About Writers and Lovers by Lily King has been calling to me. Tell Them of Battles, Kings, and Elephants. Um, a very short book that I've heard is sort of experimental, very literary. The Blind Owl. This is translated fiction from Iran, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's Iranian. Um, maybe translated from Farsi, not sure. And then Conflict is Not Abuse is a nonfiction book. It's very academic, I think. I have, I've, I don't know actually, but um, I think it's rather academic. I think it is sort of about 
you know what? I don't know what it's about, so I'm not even going to try. I think it's about conflict is not abuse. Um, the lines between, like in a world where we're really trigger happy to talk about trauma, that it can make it very difficult to have conversations that involve conflict um, without escalating. I think that's what it's about, what I've heard. And then, oh my gosh, that freaked me out. My apartment building is getting new locks. Great, cool. <laughs> Totally freaked me out. Okay, A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. Um, this I've heard is cute sci-fi or like cozy sci-fi, which I definitely have never read before, I don't think. In fact, I've read very little sci-fi at all, so, so I'm not sure if I'm going to drive with this, but I love the idea of cute sci-fi. So we'll see. Those are kind of the books, some of the books that I have in, on my, on my, I have my eye on. Yeah. I definitely have a couple others that um, I either just like don't currently have access to, but yeah, I think that's enough to get started with. So let's just get started with that. <laughs> Does this make me look like a gangster? So bad. No, I don't like it. Okay, so reading updates. I did finish In the Dream House and thinking back on what I said before, I don't really have more to say except to follow through that I did love it. It held up all the way to the end. Um, I really think I've said what I want to say in this book, except perhaps to emphasize how sophisticated the author synthesizes what is the narrative of this experience of her life while extracting the themes and approaching those in this very intellectual way, um, overarching abuse as well as more specifically queer abuse um, in queer relationships. And it, it has all this heartfelt element from her experience. And then she has moments that she dives into um, more depth into the philosophy and the history of the conversation. And all of it is both like really informative and informative as an experience I have never and would never experience. Um, it was, I just really, really loved it. I also would say that if you care about books about queer conversation and the queer community, this is one you definitely have to add to your TBR. And if you don't care too much about keeping up with queer topics in your literature, um, just from a memoir perspective, I think this really transcends even its themes into being a very excellent example of well-executed memoir. Um, experimental form, very beautifully lyrical, very sophisticated in its use of language, sophisticated in its use of the form. I'm kind of just repeating myself at this point, which is usually the sign that I loved a book and I don't want to stop talking about it. But I do think I've said everything I want to. I'm, I'm pretty sure I gave this a five star. I really loved this book. Um, I have read a lot of the lot. Well, I'm about 100 pages into it and I'm not going to talk about it because if I update my every 100 pages, this is going to be really, you guys are going to get bored of it. Um, but I'm really liking it. What I did read, though, the other day is A Psalm for the Wild Built. Um, I was in like a really bad mood. It wasn't just a bad mood. I was, I was like not feeling super well. And so I thought I'll read this like cozy sci-fi and I picked it up. And um, sometimes I think if I read in a bad mood, the book is... Put a, sort of put on a back foot and that might have been what happened here because I didn't care a whole lot about this book. Um, it is happening in a futuristic world. It is sci-fi but it is uh, sort of not exactly a utopia but sort of like a positive future. The world turned out okay um, and in this society the future humans decided that they were using too much of the earth, divided it in half, humans live on half of it, and the other half has been given back to the wild for like the rest of nature to be in. Um, but also, all of our robots that we've built to like work in factories and things um, became sentient one day and were like, we don't actually like being used for this purpose. And humans were like, okay, no problem. And they like went off into the wild and then hadn't been seen since. And then this book is ultimately about a monk who is searching for his meaning and eventually runs into one of the like long lost robots that we haven't seen for forever. I think one of the reasons I didn't like it as much as I thought I would is because I thought it would be a bit more philosophical. I thought it would be a little bit more uh, like intellectual forward, a little bit more uh, perhaps a little bit more exacting in its themes, perhaps a little bit more less narrative. And, and maybe that's my fault that I went in with the wrong expectations, except that the redeeming quality of this book for me is the last about 20 pages, where it does tie together its themes in a way that I really, really liked. 
Um, so that was a bit odd to me that the last 20 pages is exactly what I wanted the book to be the whole time and the rest of it just sort of dragged for me and it got really boring and it was really forgettable to me. I, I do think, I'm not surprised so many people liked this. I may be totally off here, but I do think the fact it ends so strongly is part of why it has been as popular as it has been. Because when a book ends really, really well, I feel like you easily forgive it for the other faults earlier in the book. But if it starts off strong and ends poorly, that's a no-go. That's a big problem. Anyway, that's where we're at for now. I'm gonna keep plugging away at Valette. Another update soon. I'm a little bit afraid I don't have enough interesting angles in my room, in my house, for uh, giving visual variety. But I, I haven't felt inclined to do like the, the B-roll of the mundanity of my life where I make a soup or something. But I don't know. <laughs> if, that, if that interests you, I could maybe do that. But for now, let's just keep it book-centric, you know? Anyway, as for Valette, what I have been reading, there's three volumes in the book, and I have finished the first volume, so I thought this might be a good point for an update. Um, about 200 pages in, I think, yeah. Lucy Snow is our protagonist. I think she's like 23 at the beginning of the book, and she's sort of staying with friends-ish in England uh, for a little while, and you get a little bit of a narrative with the people that she's living with, but pretty soon she decides she wants something different, and she goes to another country, which is based on modern-day Belgium, and then, and I don't, can't remember the name of it. It has a different name, but then there's a, I think Brussels is... Villette. Villette is the town that is based on Brussels. Anyway, so she ends up there and she ends up an English teacher at a, a girl's finishing school, boarding school, something like that. Um, I am finding some parallels to Jane Eyre, which I read like a decade ago, and I don't want to like force this in conversation. Obviously, they're both by the same author, Charlotte Bronte. Um, but similarly, and I do think it's a really effective technique, I've noticed that the protagonist uh, is beginning as a much more passive participant in the in the narrative and then becoming increasingly more of a participant in their narrative and I think it is having this effect um, that we're wanting to watch this character have this uh, personal development of sort of coming into her, her own becoming uh, sort of a self fulfilling uh, narrative for this individual. Perhaps a buildings roman, like she's kind of she's 23, so maybe it's not a coming of age story exactly. Um, but similar to Jane Eyre, it did, it did felt that Jane Eyre progressed from a, a bit more of a passive to a more of an active character. And I think we're getting that character arc in Villette with Lucy Snow, um, which means that as it goes on, it's becoming increasingly sort of drawing you in because the uh, the character is is getting all the more you know of a participant um right now like at the end of the <laughs> of the volume um she's just sort of spiraled into a little bit of a breakdown that i can't i went and read it twice because i couldn't figure out exactly what she was having a hard time with but it does feel like maybe she's having a little bit of a life crisis here um feeling a little bit unfulfilled possibly i'm loving it but i did decide to take this uh volume break as a as an opportunity to take a break and to start on The Promise. 80 pages in and finish the first of four sections of the book. So I'm gonna give you a little tidbit of what it's about so far. It takes place in South Africa following a family of five during, I think, I think it's beginning in 1980s, but I think it's a longer arching story. Um, we begin with the mother having passed away, actually. It's about her, ba her, her funeral. The promise and the premise of the story is that she has promised to one of their maids the maid's house. Not the trouble is there are racial tensions, there are family tensions of like, was that a real promise? Are we going to honor that? Um, the children are like 20 to 12, uh, son, two daughters, and the parents are divorced. And so you have sort of this like family dynamic, these, all the, all the individuals feel sort of estranged and emotionally distant and all grieving in their own ways. It is written in Stream of Consciousness. It's very much making me think of The Gathering by Anne Enright very very similar both writing style but then also like opening with a wake basically um which is very interesting it's also making me think of milkman by anna burns which both the gathering and milkman were both uh booker prize winners so there's definitely what could be called a literary style and i am finding the stream of consciousness to be really effective and really 
very beautiful and compelling but difficult in the way that stream of consciousness is that it it takes a lot of sort of like paying attention as you are drip like dropping in and out of different people's minds and different perspectives that are all extremely fluid and don't have easy divisions of like scenes and and persons and like characters involved um as your perspective's constantly changing it just like requires a lot of attention um but that aside the fact that it's sort of really taxing i am really liking a lot about this book but it feels too early to say much more about it than that so that's where we're at for now now that it's getting dark at 5 p.m i'm going to be chasing daylight for these videos and tonight we have a janky setup with a light but it works and really all i have is i want to give you um a snapshot of my thoughts about the promise which i just finished um, as sort of a wrapping up of this vlog because it feels like a good point to end and and I do really mean just a snapshot because number one um, this vlog is number is long enough number two this book is really really complex and my thoughts on it are both lengthy but also I do think this is the type of book that with more time I will I will have more robust thoughts on it and I, and I want to give it time to simmer but some of my initial thoughts are, one, that I'm not at all surprised that it won the Booker Prize, and I definitely think it is a contender for a modern classic. It is both very important and potent in its themes and very sophisticated and talented in its execution and exhibit of literary talent. Um, I, I quite liked the way that it was written. It's written in very stream of consciousness, though it did take me a minute to get into it, but I did really, really like it. Um, the story I think I've already talked about, it takes place in South Africa and follows this family of five um, and multiple funerals over a span of 30 years and a promise that is being very reluctant to be honored. The family in this story though I think is, in ways I haven't quite pieced together, I think is a metaphor for the political uh, stage and the political climate of South Africa over the span of this 30 years is sort of like a microcosm to examine these broader uh, themes. There are some really sophisticated themes that are also being examined as this family being used as a metaphor for the broader political climate at the time, including ways that it that taking so long and dragging your feet in righting wrongs hurts everybody. I do think that that's a really important message, especially in a post-colonial world, in a neo-colonial world. And maybe as a final note, I would say that my favorite part of this book was probably, I would say, how many times I was taken aback in delight by the way that the author paired the form and aesthetic of the words of the language with the themes and the tone of the narrative um, so you're you know you're feeling something in terms of what's happening in terms of story and and yet like what you're feeling is so well mimicked in the aesthetic form of the language and and I like that's so hard to sort of abstractly describe but um, things like tone and pacing and and the choice of words being soft or hard or things like that was just really really impressive to me and I really really enjoyed it. I'm going to end this video here, um, though I do have so many more thoughts on this book and I'm contemplating more of a video. If that interests you, let me know, but absolutely no promises. I I have been reading more of Villette, but um, I'm just gonna drag that into the next vlog and we'll keep updating there. So as for now, we'll end here. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in another video. Bye!